Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. This episode is brought to you by CampingSurvival.com. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including bug out bags, long-term storage food, water filters, gas masks, and first aid kits. Check them out online today at CampingSurvival.com. Be sure to enter coupon code PREPPERRECON for a 5% discount on your entire order. Today's guest is Thomas Shaka from CampingSurvival.com. Tom, thanks for coming on the show. Sure, Mark. Thanks for having me. I'm pretty excited about this. I don't do this kind of thing very often, and and I love it when I do, so thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's our pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and when you started CampingSurvival.com? Good question. Um, We started, I started Camping Survival, I think about 2002, I think, something like that. Um, I've been in business for myself for about 18 years, and and uh, we, we sell tools for guest electric service, but um, survival preparedness is more my passion, and I've been doing it since I was a kid. Heck, I, I think I got my kids to, my parents were at to store away water when I was a little kid. It just seemed like the right thing to do. You know, I had no idea why or what prompted that, but I mean, from there, you know, I, I did a bunch of things. We camped a lot growing up, and did a ton of stuff outdoors, and hunted, and then I joined the Marine Corps, and did that in a desert storm, learned some survival skills there, and and um, and then, I don't know how many years ago, we lived down in Maryland, my wife at the time and I, and um, out near, near D.C., and, and I just had the, this feeling like we'd come home from the grocery store. Before I really became a, you know, a, I guess a prepper, whatever you want to call it, I'd come home from the grocery store and I said to myself, you know, boy, I'd be okay if anything happened right now, we'd be okay for a little while, we're well stocked. And, and that just stuck into my head. I was like, why am I thinking that? What does this mean? And I kind of investigated a little bit more. And then pretty quickly I, I became a, you know, a prepper. Then the whole Y2K thing. I can't even say prepper. It's it's such a funny word these days for these crazy shows. But, <laughs> um, you know, that's kind of how I got my start. And then um, uh, so I've been doing it for a while. And I had some skills. I, I go to survival schools and all that stuff. And, and, um, and I just decided, you know, heck, I'm going to, uh, with my business experience from my tool company, I'm going to start another site, and I selected CampingSurvival.com because uh, um, I, survival. I, I, I didn't want to be a fear monger, and I didn't want to, you know, be all about doom and gloom. You know, the end of the world. I mean, you can't, in my opinion, you can't really live that way. It'd just be so depressing. And to me, um, that's why I started Camping Survival. It kind of softens it up. And in a lot of survival situations, like post hurricane, post you know, any type of a disaster, it almost seems like the people are living in like a camping mode. Of course, it's not fun and there's a lot more stress, but but the needs and the challenges, it can be similar. And so that's kind of how Camping Survival came about, is um, kind of softening up survival and and making it, you know, more acceptable. And if, you know, the husband and wife buy stuff from us, it's like, hey, honey, I didn't buy survival gear, I bought camping gear, (laughs) you know. So, uh, and then from there, it's just been fun. I, I, I try new products and make my videos and and so on. We're just having a lot of fun with it. Very cool, very cool. And you're going to be helping us uh, put together some, some basic uh, essentials for a bug-out bag today. I guess we should start with uh, what's the best bug-out bag to use for your base to, to, to build your 72-hour kit? Whew. Um, my favorite bags, and I know these are tough questions because um, it's, it's, it, there's so many variables, and it depends on where your bug out, what your bug out options are, what your, why you're bugging out, that type of thing. But generally, I like our sandpiper bags. Um, if you go on a website, I met these folks years ago at a trade show. I think it was a shot show. Oh, I forgot where it was. Uh, probably Vegas. But um, they were a luggage manufacturer, and then they kind of sprung off because this was a guy's passion, this type of thing. And now they make military bags, that type of thing. And um, my favorite is the, the 5016. I use that for travel. I use it for for a ton of things. But um, the reason I like it, it's good size. It's, it's basically a, um, it's a pretty good size backpack. And it's got lots of compartments because, in my opinion, if you're going to throw a bag together, you really have to, uh, in my opinion, you do it yourself. We do sell bags, and I hate to talk them down. We sell kits and such. I mean, we sell lots of kits where we offer them. But my, I'm more of a fan of building your own kit. So if you start with, like, for example, a sandpaper bag, and it's got several different compartments for organization, you know where everything is. If you're building it yourself, 
uh, rather than going and buying one pre-assembled, um, you're going to know how to use it, what's there, where everything is, and that type of thing. That's my opinion. And there's there's two basic schools of thought about what color you should get for your bag. Um, the one school of thought says that uh, if you, if you have a camo bag or a military looking bag, it's going to mark you as a prepper, and people may try to take what you have. The other school of thought says that a military style bag marks you as a hard target, and predators will try to find a softer target to hit. What do you think? That's a great question. Um, I, on that, I know lots of people, lots of companies out there sell these bright orange bags, and that drives me absolutely nuts. Um, I, I'm also not a fan of the camel bags. I like the, the one that I use. It's Coyote Brown. It's it's um, the 5016 bag on our site. It's, it's uh, Coyote Brown, and the reason I like that is, um, and again, I have a couple of these bags. I even use it for flying, and no one really notices it. But I, if I guarantee you. Um, in any type of situation, if you've got a bright orange bag, you've got a camel bag, or you've got a really tactical-looking bag, people are going to notice you. And uh, it can even change the way you carry yourself, in my opinion. It, you kind of reflect what you're wearing. and even you know, So if you just have kind of a benign-looking, maybe coyote brown, or even black. I like coyote brown because it's a little more benign even than black is. But um, I think that's extremely important. I think blending... Um, it's a little big for a college uh, campus backpack, but that's not even a bad idea. In my opinion, looking, um, you, you don't want to look scary. You don't want to look prepared. You also don't want to look like a, an easy target. In my opinion, the way you carry yourself is going to change that. So if you have a benign-looking bag, you don't look prepared, you don't look military, but if you carry yourself well, um, and you pay attention to you know the, the, your the security area around you, and, and you're vigilant about that type of stuff. I think that's the best plan. Yeah, so you're sort of uh, saying to, to sort of be the gray man. You just Bingo. you kind of blend into your surroundings, and that's the best thing. Absolutely. So we don't want we don't want camo, and we don't want Dora the Explorer. <laughs> exactly. No. <laughs> okay. All right. So probably the most. Comp- important component of a bug out bag is water of course you'll want some measure of water that you can take with you but that gets heavy fast i think a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds Mm -hmm. a bag also needs to have some means of purifying water if money is no concern what's the best water filter out there for a bug out bag well um i think to be prepared for water you have to have more than just a filter um and the reason i say that is you don't really know where your water source is, for one. And most filters or purifiers, they're still not 100% effective. It's like 9999. And when I go, you know, say winter camping or we go canoeing for a week or something, um, I like to do like a two-step treatment. I like to kill everything in the water with a chemical uh, purifier, such as the water purification tabs, and then filter it because, of course, there could be chemicals. So you don't want to just kill everything in the water because you can't kill chemicals. So if I'm in the woods, for example, for a week or when I was in the military, that type of thing, um, I didn't want to take a chance. Imagine, you know, in a survival situation and just by chance that one-tenth of one, one, one percent or whatever it is, you get something and you're down, that, that there goes your chances of survival. So um, I like that to in water filters, the pumps. So that's what I would do. I would use a two-step treatment, maybe even three, maybe even pre-filter it with uh, like a coffee filter or something like that. seems like overkill. I mean, if you don't have time and you're on the run, boom, you grab your cadmium filter and, you, and it's, you're, you're going to be good to go. But if you are in an environment where um, um, you have the ability to do this, I like to get you know sediment, dirt, and all that stuff out of it, then kill it with a chemical um, purifier, and then um, use a cadmium water filter, for example. Um, if you, if you can, if not, boom. You know, in certain environments, uh, tactical and rush environments, you're just going to have to use a cadmium filter. But I prefer a two or three stage treatment myself. And and then for the the chemical for killing the the uh, potential pathogens, what do you recommend? Do you like the uh, the biodon tablets? Um, I my favorite is um, chlorflock. It's the stuff I used in the military. But there's a potential problem with that. Um, 
what, what, what it does is it's chlorflac. It has a flocking agent. So you put this into your container, and it gathers all the impurities, dust, uh, that sediment, all that type of thing, drops it to the bottom of your container, and then the chlorine agent, chlorflac, then that goes about killing everything in it. Now, <laughs> I foolishly learned years ago, I had a kitted in water bottle. You know, the water bottles, they have a little filter inside, and you can drink right through it like a... Uh, just a normal water bottle. Right. Well, I foolishly used the kitted and I'm sorry, the, the chlorflock. Uh, on our site, it's Ross-7741 as the item number. But I used the chlorflock in this container, and what it do? It dropped the sediment to the bottom of the kitted and filter bottle, and where does it filter from? It draws right from the bottom. So I clogged my filter up pretty quickly. So, um, in that situation, I would just use like potable aqua or something like that. I, I prefer the chlorine stuff myself. But um, so, it, it, if you're aware that this chlorflock is going to be dropping the sediment to the bottom of the container, that's what I would prefer. Just have to be aware of it. Very good. Yeah. So unless your name's Cody Lundin, you probably want to have some storable food in your bag. What foods do you recommend to keep someone alive for 72 hours? It's a great question. Um, quickly, I would say that, that um, I study edible and medicinal plants. I have for a long time. I highly recommend that because, again, you're not going to be able to carry enough to sustain yourself. You have got to have other methods. But um, what I would prefer, my, my favorite now, uh, my favorite food is Backpacker's Pantry. I don't know if you've heard of them yet, but everyone knows Mountain House and and we, do, we have a ton of different types of foods. But uh, it's relatively new to us, rather, as Backpacker's Pantry. And the reason I like them is I've been preaching for years. Um, we, we really do sell some survival gear, I mean survival food, but I really don't consider most of our food survival food. In my opinion, you know, something happens, you know, um, some kind of a tragedy, and, and you go into survival mode. You don't want to instantly go to... Survival food, like MREs, and I love MREs. I use them all the time, and my kids even. But um, you don't want to develop digestive, you know, problems. I like to eat good food, even in a survival situation post disaster. And Backpackers Pantry, I highly recommend you just buy one or two and taste test them. There's a huge variety of them, super long shelf life, but they, in my opinion, are by far the tastiest products out there as far as uh, you know, dehydrated or freeze dried food, that type of thing. Highly recommend Backers Packer, Backpackers Pantry. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, sh now, shelter's heavy to carry. It can really weigh down a, a bug out bag, but exposure to the elements can actually take you out faster than hunger or dehydration. What are some good lightweight shelter options? Well, depending on the size of your pack, and again, you mentioned this earlier, it's hard to determine. Um, know what size pack it's also going to depend on your frame your body structure how, how long you figure you're going to travel if that's known that type of thing one thing i love in my packs is a um a couple of one's a tube tent we sell them from coglins basically all it is is a big huge trash bag a really thick one with both ends cut off and it's super light there's nothing to it with that um tube tent and some paracord, which I, I recommend highly in all your bags. It's awesome stuff if you haven't checked it out, folks. But um, with that, you can make a shelter almost immediately. You're, you're, um, it's not going to be the ideal tent. You can actually find ways to close off the ends as well. But that would be my first thought. Um, simple, lightweight, easy to use. You don't have to worry about, oh, man, my, my tent pole broke or anything like that. It's, it's simple, and, and I love tube tents. Beyond that... Um, uh, it's, there's just a million options. It's really hard for me to recommend uh, anything more than that. But um, I'm also a big fan of ultralight tents, just one or two man tents, and and just, you know oh, I love having a, the, just the screen one that I have. If I go hiking or uh, along a, a beach or a, a camp somewhere just to keep the bugs off you, I highly recommend that too. It's not going to those types of tents aren't going to keep the, the the weather off you. But um, again, it depends on what type of year. It's, it's really hard to hard to answer that. But my favorite is a tube tent. Very cool. Also, if someone's bugging out in a colder climate, they need some way to keep warm. What's a good low price option for a sleeping bag? Um, well, that's another another. I'm a big fan of improvising. In fact, um, 
I don't know if anybody, if you or if your listeners um, know Ron Hood and Karen Hood and their videos. Ron, unfortunately, passed away a while back. But one of the videos he did, um, and we did something similar to this in the Marine Corps, but I loved one of his videos um, where he brought trash bags, big, you know, industrial-sized trash bags, and he loaded it up with leaves. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm all about improvise, adapt, and overcome. So that's my first thought. In my bag, I would recommend you have more of these trash bags. And um, you can even make a pillow out of them, you know, that type of thing. And if you stuff them and even stuff your clothes um, with, with natural materials, you can protect yourself. Beyond that, um, I've, got a, I've got a couple of Eurekas. Um, and, and they're, you know, different temperatures, but they're big and bulky. And so that's my option. I've got the, the Eurekas, and I grab the right one for the right time of year. But I also, again, recommend having the trash bags. They're so useful. Very cool. And uh, also on the subject of staying warm, fire is essential. It also keeps predators away in the great outdoors at night. Uh, always recommend people have at least three ways of producing fire in their bug out bag. What are your three favorite fire starting solutions? Great question. Um, I have on me at all times a couple different sized ferocium rods or feral rods, or it's spelled feral cerium. We sell a bunch of them. I highly recommend them. And um, beyond that, make, make sure you go the extra mile and learn how to um, use it and find natural tinders. I mean, we have different types of tinders. And, in fact, I study this stuff, but I always have some kind of a tinder on me, whether it's, um, you know, wet fire tinder, which is absolutely awesome, or you can even make your own with dryer lint you know, or cotton balls and Vaseline. I just did a presentation for a, a women's organization really, recently, and they were just stunned when I started lighting the, the, the cotton balls on fire. And then I added Vaseline to them and extended the life of the cotton ball significantly, giving you plenty of time to start a fire. So if you've got ferocium rods, um, I've got them on a couple of my keychains. I've got a, at least a couple of them on every pack. I highly recommend it. That, that's my answer, but you got to practice with it. Um, you know, start throwing a spark at things, and you'll find that um, if if you plan ahead and you prepare, like you prepare a fire bed, for example, three things you should really think about when, to make fire. You need uh, heat, you need oxygen, and you need fuel. The heat will be the ferocium rod, the spark coming off the ferro rod. Um, the fuel, of course, will be sticks, and then. Um, the oxygen is you know, all around, but the, but the reason that's important is to get your fire bed ready. Make sure there's airflow. That's often the reason um, people can't start a fire. It amazes me how many people camp and can't start a fire. <laughs> so um, you, know, you get your fire on, you get your fire bed ready, and then you get small sticks, bigger sticks, larger sticks, and you you you, you get your tinder, whether it's cotton balls and Vaseline, or you find milkweed pods, or or you know cattail fluff, whatever. Throw a spark at it. Start feeding your um, your um, fuel, the, the stick onto it. Keep the air flow, and um, boom, you'll have a fire sound. But that's my recommendation: ferro rods or ferrocerium or ferrocerium rods. I absolutely love them. Very good. And I had never heard the the cotton balls and Vaseline before. I'd heard dryer lint before, but uh, but that's a that's a great tip. Thanks for it. that one. It's fun. Go back. Go buy yourself a bag. Make sure it's cotton. Though sometimes there's polyester, you know, cotton balls. Make sure it's real cotton. Um, um, cotton balls and without the Vaseline throw a spark at it you'll see it burns for like maybe a minute you know but when you work the Vaseline through it don't put too much on it you don't want to smolder you want to, you want the fibers to be exposed still and you'll see that it burns several minutes with the Vaseline on it it's a lot of fun very cool another important tool is your knife what's the best knife for the money boy um that also brings on the debate of a big knife or a small knife. In fact, we have a very active Facebook page with almost 100,000 fans, and that's one of the questions I pose up often is, do you prefer a big knife or a small knife? Um, I, I have two knives on me usually in the woods. I have a folding knife, and uh, then I have a, you know, like about a six-inch blade straight blade knife. And... Um, the brand, I mean, I used to like Topps knives. I decided I don't like them anymore. Uh, they're, they're just, um, um, it's, it's not the kind of woodsy knife that I like. But uh, right now, I'm, right in my pocket, I've got a cold steel knife. And the reason I like that is I, I think it's a good price for the product. 
Um, I know there are people out there that, that don't like cold steel for whatever reason, but um, not everyone has an unlimited budget to, to buy the high-end knives um, that they might want. So um, I think that's a good option is cold steel. I think um, once you start investigating your knives and you learn more about them, then I would recommend you know maybe even getting a custom knife, that type of thing. But um, cold steel is a great way to start, in my opinion. Very good. And a knife's uh, probably an area you want to have redundancy in. You, like you said, you have uh, you got the, the a big knife and a folding knife as well. Uh, also, a, a multi tool has usually got a knife blade on it and several other tools. What's your favorite multi tool, and what functions uh, does that specific model have on it? That's a great question too. Um, I failed to mention. I said I usually have two knives, but now that I think about it, I actually always have three knives. I don't know if you heard my Velcro on my belt, but I just opened up my multi-tool. I always have a multi-tool on me as well, and I carry the the Leatherman uh, Blast. I've, I've carried the Leatherman Wave in the past, but I, I'd like this this um, the Leatherman Blast now. And it, the reason I like it is a couple of reasons. It's not just for um, you know woods work or preparedness and survival, that type of thing. It blows my mind how a lot of people don't carry a multi-tool. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I think it is is because when you have it, you use it. And when you don't, you don't think about it. I use my Leatherman, my Leatherman multi-tool constantly, all day long. I mean, it has the, you know, the, the scissors, a couple different, um, you know, a Phillips head, a flat tip, and a, a large one, a small one. It has a saw, it has a file, it has a needle nose pliers and the wire cutters. Um, cheapers, uh, what else? And of course, a nice straight blade, and a nice locking blade as well. Um, yeah, it's just it's just an awesome tool. I mean, I I, I beat the heck out of this thing, and and it's, I'm just playing it right now. It still works terrifically. I love Leatherman. That's great. Yeah, it's a it's a great product. Uh, and you mentioned paracord before. That's got so many uses. You can use it for constructing shelter or or uh, helping you to bundle up sticks to pack back to the campsite, or or uh, you can even pull out the individual strands inside to build snares, multiple snares, or fishing, or you could even build a bow, I suppose. Um, you had some uh, unique paracord products at CampingSurvival.com. Can you tell us about those? Absolutely. Um, one of my, my – I'm going braces. I'm wearing a bracelet right now with paracord, and it's got – fishing line in it, it has a fire striker, and it's just a little survival kit, but um, the reason I like paracord is, I, I, I kind of use the phrase, it's a survival kit in every strand, as you mentioned, you've got the outer sheath, and you've got the seven inner strands, it's just so versatile and strong and durable, but one of my favorite things to do, I've been doing for years, is I replace my, my shoes and boot laces with paracord, and some with some shoes, it's really hard to do because when you do it yourself, you know, you've got to melt the ends and sometimes it's hard to get the, uh, you know, the end through the eyelet and then you might wrap, you know, tape around it and, you know, try and get it through the eyelet and it's kind of a pain and sometimes it ends up looking kind of crappy to be honest with you and, and that might be important to some people and plus you don't really want to look like you have paracord in your shoelaces. So what we came up with a number of years ago, I forgot how many years ago it was, but I contacted a, a shoelace manufacturing company and I sent them down paracord and I said, hey, you know, can you produce shoelaces out of this? And they did. They're, they're just like any other shoelaces. They're professional. And here's the thing. I compared our places on our paracord shoelaces to Walmart shoe, shoelaces, and we were actually less expensive. So you can have, and they're significantly stronger. I mean, I've had paracord in my shoelaces for years, and I've never blown them out. And I've blown shoe, shoelaces out over the years many times. So, you know, you can have a survival kit in every strand right in your shoes and boots, and that's great for making fire bowls as well, too. I mean, if you're going to use a regular shoe, shoelace for a fire bowl, it's a pretty good chance you're going to blow it out. They're just nowhere near as strong is uh, paracord highly recommended it's really simple and if you get the professional ones no one's even going to know you have shoelaces in, i mean paracord in your shoelaces i love it yeah very cool yeah it's it's one thing if you're if you work a construction job or, or some kind of a blue collar job but a lot of people that work in an office they they couldn't really have something with melted uh tips on the end Bingo. <laughs> so exactly. so that's that's great and uh what are some good self-defense products that a person can put in their bug out bag well, 
that's that's a tough question because it's going to depend on your area, your laws, that type of thing. I'm I'm a big fan of carrying. Um, I, I hate to be without a firearm in the woods, but but that aside, um, I I like having a stick with me, um, a hiking stick. And that has so many uses, but it's also a good defense product. You can keep some away from you. And if you, if you train with it, you can actually learn how to, to use it properly. But I highly recommend a stick, a walking stick, that type of thing. Uh, just keep your distance, even from an animal. Um, imagine that you know, you're walking along and, and it, it would just be an, an annoying animal or a rabid animal, that type of thing. Some, something that isn't even vicious. I mean, you're not going to keep a mountain lion off of you with a stick, but, if you're walking along and something approaches you, human or animal, that's a can become very valuable. Just just to keep your distance and um, and that type of thing. I highly recommend that. Um, I'm oh, let's just talk about this. Anyway, I mentioned I have ferocium rods on my keychain. They come in different lengths. Um, that can be a nice defensive weapon as well. I you know I don't know how far I want to get into that, but that's another thing um, you might want to consider. And of course your knife. But with I probably want to get into this as well, but with most things, such as that stick or a knife or a firearm, I think practice is extremely important. I'm not a big fan of just doing something to do it. Um, yeah, hey, I've, you know, I've got a firearm, or hey, I've got a, a knife, and hey, I've, I've got a stick, you know, or, or whatever, or I've got a club. Um, if, if the time comes where you have to use something, you really want to have some memory, some muscle memory, and some training. So whatever weapon you decide to use, not even a weapon, whatever whatever you, you choose to have with you that may be a weapon, highly recommend you get some training um, and practice with it. Very good. That's great advice. Um, of course, we'll have links in today's show notes to CampingSurvival.com. And uh, for our listeners out there, don't forget to use coupon code PREPARECON to get 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. And... Uh, you always have a lot of different specials going on on this site. Is that right, Tom? Oh yeah, we're um, we're constantly coming up with ideas. We we send out two emails a week. Actually, if you want to get on our email list, go to our homepage and get out. We send out two emails, and every one, um, my assistant manager and I, we sit down. We says, okay, we got to come up. With, you know, we're doing this all the time, and we've got a couple big sales going on right now. We've got a bunch of big sales coming up, and and uh, we just have fun with it. We. We have a lot of product here. We have 16,000 items, and we have a warehouse full of products. So we'll walk to the warehouse and we'll say, Jeepers, we have a bunch of these here. We just got a huge shipment in. Let's move them really quick. So we already have a sale price on them, but if we put in an email you know, with additional discount or maybe we'll even throw something in, that's another thing we do, too, is we give away stuff a ton. And so in these emails, you might have the opportunity to get something free, something if you've never tried an MRE. You know, there might be a time you give an MRE, which is a meal ready to eat. Some people uh, love them. Some people have never tried them. So keep an eye out for our specials. We're giving away free stuff all the time, giving away discounts, and, and we just have a lot of fun with our emails. And then uh, where else can folks find you besides CampingSurvival.com? I think you mentioned that you had a Facebook page. Oh, absolutely. We we love social media. We're big on YouTube. I just made two new videos today, actually. I made a video on canned hot dogs and another one on our Oregon fruit. And uh, check us out on YouTube, Camping Survival. We're on Pinterest and all the others. But my favorite, uh, it might be YouTube, I'm not sure. One of my favorites is Facebook. We actually have two Facebook pages. One is Facebook Camping Survival, and then the other one is Facebook Camping Survival Women. And our Facebook Camping Survival page has cheapers. I think like 90,000 fans. The women's page has like 50,000 fans. And we post throughout the day. And, and we, we do post up deals and specials and new products and that type of thing. But the majority of it is just good, fun, survival, prepping, outdoor camping humor or information. And um, we just we just really have a lot of fun with it. And I have some great people that help me with that stuff. So, you know, Facebook, YouTube, just... Just Google uh, Camping Survival, and, and heck, the first page will come up with all of our stuff. Very cool. And, Tom, you mentioned that you were in the military, so thank you very much for your service. Um, I also want to thank you for your sponsorship uh, of PrepperRecon.com, and thanks for taking time to come on today's show. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I hope I can do it again. An economic storm is headed our way. The die has been cast. We must spread the word and prepare. The coming collapse will bring a contest between tyranny and freedom. If the patriot is to prevail, we must stand as one, 
pledge allegiance to our God, and defend the Constitution. If you are new to prepping or would like to learn more, read our 7-step survival plan. You can find it under categories on the left-hand side of our website. Thanks for listening to the Prepper Recon Podcast. God bless and happy prepping.